Welcome back, everyone, to the Writer's Parachute, where we are guiding author and writer dreams to a perfect landing. We have with us today another very special guest. It's Michael Stewart, and we're going to talk about a different kind of book. His book is The Hills Be Shaking. It is a crime action thriller. We'll be talking to him in just a moment about his book. But of course, we want to let you know to go ahead and smash that like button. Go ahead and follow us here on YouTube or on the podcast channel where you're listening. Uh, you can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Writer Parachute. That is Writer Parachute with no S. So we always start off with the topic of the week. And this season, we've been focusing on reviews. So we've been talking about how to get reviews, how to ask for reviews, what kinds of reviews there are. So now we're going to talk about it using the sandwich method. So we talk about how to write a review. And we say that it's easy, but a lot of people don't tell you the best way to do it. So we're going to give you some light parameters here called the sandwich method. So generally, when you're writing a review, you want to break it into three parts. You want to start with a description of the details of the book that were important to you. It doesn't have to be the full details. It's just what stuck out to you, what you liked or didn't like about it. The second thing you want to talk about is the critique the parts that you really liked, the parts that you didn't like, the things that you thought could be better. And then we always want to end on a positive note, uh, exacerbating the positive things, what you liked about the book, what you thought was done well about the book. So think about this as a sandwich method. We start with the details. In the middle, we have the critique or what could be better. At the end, we finish it off with all the things that are great about the book. So next time you're writing a review or you're thinking about writing a review, just think about the sandwich method. We try to hide that, that negative stuff in the middle and start off with the good stuff and end with the good stuff. So that's a quick reminder about how to do a review if you're writing reviews. And I do encourage authors to write reviews. It's a great way to get audiences towards your book. If you're writing reviews, then they're going to depend on you for recommendations of books. And then they might take a look at your books too. So keep that in mind. And of course, if you're just a reader, we really do need authors need those reviews. They are king. They're what get us noticed out in the public realm. So let's go ahead and move on to our uh, interview for this week. As I said earlier, we have Michael Stewart. He is an author, writer, engineer. We're going to be talking to him about his book, The Hills Be Shaking. It's an action crime thriller. So we have Michael Stewart is an award-winning author and the number one bestseller. He lives in the sunflower covered hills of Kansas with his dear wife and six lively children. Wow. <laughs> um, Stewart worked for two decades as an engineer designing streets and highways. He now writes books with action, science, and a little mix of MacGyver and Die Hard. He has published two novels, the latest being The Hills Be Shaken, which reached number one shortly after its debut. It has caught the attention of top reviewers. This mystery is scored monthly five-star ratings on Amazon and 97% of readers liked it on Goodreads. There you go with those reviews. Just proving my point. The crime novel is available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook. Welcome to the Writer's Parachute. Michael, how are you today? Good. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, Donna. Great to be here. Well, I don't have a copy of the book. I'm assuming you have a copy of the book. Could you hold that up for our yeah. members that are watching us here on YouTube so they can see yeah. this book and uh, know what we're talking about? So I I read most of this book. I haven't finished it, but I'm kind of glued to the pages and I really, I really love it. And I tried to sneak the end out from you and you're not giving me that, but I will keep reading just to figure it out. I need to know if I'm right. So- I want to know why adding engineering into a thriller setting was important for this story, because I thought I thought it was a very unique and unusual way to kind of bring that science and engineering forward in, in a crime thriller. <laughs> yeah, um, so the yeah, the premise of it is it's a it's a tragedy uh, in in Kansas, in the city of Manhattan. Um, so, uh, it's near Manhattan is one of the largest lakes in Kansas and the, in the opening chapter, this tragedy occurs, which is, uh, the dam collapses and, um, a uh, big lake, a lot of water. 
So um, when that sort of thing happens, um, there's sort of a fog of information on the day of, and no one really knows what's going on. Is it, was it a earthquake or was it a, uh, maybe a terrorist attack and nobody knows. And um, so they call on the experts, the engineers to investigate, you know, how this happened, how it could have happened if it was an attack. And that's where um, the main character, Mose Haley, who is an engineer, uh, gets pulled into the FBI investigation because they need an engineer to help. And um, then they begin to get worried about other um, future attacks. And so they decide to make uh, hire a, a team of experienced engineers to become FBI agents. And um, so it kind of goes from there. I liked the, the, the engineering part of it. Obviously uh, it, it starts off with, like I said, the dam collapse and what makes a dam, you know, stay up the, the mm-hmm. and what would make it fall down. Um, and so I think that's an interesting side of it to, to uh, explain that. And, and so a reader understands, but Also along the way, there's just a lot of uh, kind of what I think are fun action sequences that the main character gets into. There's a a chase through a sewer system, an an escape through a sewer system. There's a um, a, uh, a burning uh, wind turbine where they're trapped in a burning wind turbine. And in order to uh, make the action sequences um, have some weight and meaning, I had to explain a little bit of the uh, engineering side of it, how the pumps work in a, in a storm sewer system and how, uh, how does a wind turbine operate? And why is the, why is the, um, the, the, the radiator so important and what would happen if the radiator broke when people are up there? And, and then from there it becomes, some, again, some fun action sequences that people I think can really visualize because the engineering side of it is explained. Right. And just for those of of you who haven't read the book or are curious about this, he's talking about that they're concerned that this might have been a terrorist attack on the dam and future terrorist attacks on infrastructure, which is why they're dragging in the engineers, because, you know, the FBI doesn't know a whole lot about how dams and bridges and and, and sewer systems work. So uh, I thought that was really interesting. And I love that, that you're drawing in the information just enough so that we understand how he's going to figure out how to save the day. And I love this, that this, this poor kind of mild mannered character of Mose Haley is just, you know, he just keeps saying, I'm just an engineer, but he's, he's thinking so outside, so far outside the box. And he just kind of comes up with these amazing plans kind of at the <laughs> last minute and saves it. so he becomes this hero without you know kind of this unexpected hero and it's pretty it's pretty good and I loved it I, I was chuckling through some of it and I you know I love that scene where he was just kind of hiding on the roof and the FBI you know, came in and <laughs> propelled over the side of the roof and arrested him that was kind of like oh okay <laughs> that was that was interesting <laughs> so um so I know that that there's a lot of, of uh, engineering involved. And I know your background is that, but there's also a lot of FBI and police procedural involved in this. So I wanted to know how much research you had to do or were you able to get an advisor to help you with that part of the book? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess I guess that there's two parts to that. One part, you can call it research if you want, but I grew up watching a ton of Die Hard movies and Lethal Weapon movies and uh, gritty thrillers like Seven uh, about the police, uh, police pr- uh, procedural and um, and and I know that doesn't really count as research, but that's really what sparked my interest in those sort of things, mm-hmm. and then led me to dig deeper into some more authentic research. Uh, for one thing, my father-in-law's a retired uh, police detective. So I would always hear stories from him about interviews. He was, you know, interviewing a suspect and things like that. And I would ask him questions and I was able to get some input on this book as well um, to make sure I was, you know, as authentic as I could be. Correct. Yes. So what about the FBI? Because I I thought that was really interesting that, that the things that you brought out about the FBI that were not particularly known so was this just in your imagination or did you actually get the background on some of these things that I mean I don't want to expose national security or anything (laughs) but I you know I'm just I was just curious if this was just 
fun of you stretching the actual limits or was this stuff that you actually had researched and found out about? Um, some of the things like the training an FBI agent goes through, I did mm -hmm. research on that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, on the FBI's website where they're, you know, recruiting, you know, new agents and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, again, I, um, there, you know, if there might've been something that, um, some of the day-to-day -day events that occurred that, that may not have been exactly, um, that might, might've just been part of the story that I told, but yeah, okay. most of it, I tried to be as authentic as I could. And I looked, looked the things up. So. Okay. Well, that's great. Cause I, I was, you know, I was a little surprised by a few things. So I was, I was kind of curious about that. So I want to know what you would like readers to gain from reading The Hills Be Shaking. Be shaken. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the first thing is just um, that they enjoy the book. I, 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 my goal was to tell an entertaining story. And, um, and here, you know, when people are having fun reading it and want to keep turning pages to find out what happens, that, that's the first thing I like hearing from people. Um, I, I suppose the second thing, you know, you, the title, The Hills Be Shaken, is um, is taken from, a, you know, the Bible verse in Isaiah, mm -hmm. the, uh, and, the, and the, 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 the point of that Bible verse is that, you know, bad things, tragedies can happen, but if we stick together and we, you know, rely on God, we can get through it. And so I think that's uh, kind of the background theme of the whole story is, that this was a terrible tragedy, but we're, we can get through it. And, um, and it also is just literal too. the hills be shaken because it's about a dam that collapses. And <laughs> right. so I thought it was kind of a fun, a fun title in that, in that way. Well, you know, it was interesting because you, you mentioned at the beginning of the book, a portion of that scripture and I was a little lost because it sounded familiar, but I couldn't quite place it. But then later on, when the character mentions that you give the full scripture and you and I kind of talked about that in the green room that it, then it made a whole lot more sense and it kind of made sense why the title was that it's like I could kind of see that that kind of merge of all of those things so it was interesting so I I, I was very uh, very taken back when I first got the book I was kind of like why why was this the title but then when I read that uh I understood so um <laughs> That, that I'm glad that you went ahead and voluntarily gave that information. So I don't know if you could go back to the beginning when you were first publishing and writing your book uh, or the other book that you've written, what do you wish that you had known or that somebody had told you? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, you mentioned the other book I'd written, which I published first before, before the Hills be shaken. And, and I, probably made every mistake you could make when it comes to publishing that that first time got which is good because I got the mistakes out of the way and learned from them mm -hmm. um just thing you know I didn't know what an ISDN was and the importance of that I didn't uh I didn't get a copyright I didn't get the the, the book copyrighted at first things like that um but I think the biggest thing is um that I, that I is just taking your time. And I, you know, I think for me anyway, and I would imagine a lot of other authors are this way, but when you kind of make that decision that it's time to publish or you're ready to publish, you get really excited and you just want it out there tomorrow. And, and I didn't take the time to finish editing properly my first novel. I didn't proof, it wasn't proofread properly. So there was typos in it um, and the review, you know, I heard about it in the reviews. And um, so I had to, that. so just take your time. This my, With my second <laughs> novel, I uh, gave myself a lot more time and it still probably wasn't enough because again, I was excited to get it out there and be published. Sure. Um, but, but yeah, I would say just, yeah, there's, rushing um you don't need to rush it you know if, if it's delayed a month that's not going to be the end of the world just get it get it right and make sure it's uh it's um you've you've done it properly and that would probably be the biggest thing 
Well, and just for those out there like Michael who rushed their book to publish and they find all these errors after the fact, you know, that is what is amazing about the the industry we have now is we have the ability to go fix that. We have the ability to go in there and correct those chain, you know, those those mistakes. Uh, now I have two minds about that because I have mistakes in my books and uh, different mistakes in each of my books, but I leave them there purposely because I want to my want my readers to see my progress, to see that I'm getting better, that I'm improving as an author and a writer. But you know, big mistakes, yeah, I'm gonna go fix those. But you know, the little ones, I don't, I don't worry too much about it as long as you know it's understandable. And that's that's kind of my thoughts on it. I, I try not to dive into that perfectionism because I always believe you learn more from from messing up than you do from being perfect. So For you sure. know, there's yeah. a, there's a lesson in that. But you know, it's not the end of the world if it happens. You know, you have the ability to go back and fix that. So. I think that's great advice to, you know, take your time, you know, to think about it. You know, we talk about sometimes here on the Writer's Parachute about what is a reasonable schedule and what is wishful, hopeful thinking, you know, because that's where we get into these problems. They're like going, oh, I could have this done in six months. Well, sure you can. But the question then is, is it good? You know, right. is it a good book? You know, is is it worth somebody reading? It, whereas if you took a year, maybe it would be a better book. So mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, with there, yeah, there's nothing wrong with setting an, an aggressive goal, but you don't have to chain yourself to that. If you get six months down the road and and it's it doesn't mean you have to hold yourself to that six months you set. Mm -hmm. Maybe you made a lot of progress and you did really good. And you need another month and that's okay. Or you need another three months or six months and that's fine too. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, and there's all kinds of things that you could be doing with that time. Even if you're done writing, there's all the promotion, the pre-promotion, the pre-reviews, the, uh, you know, the, the, the beta readers, the proofreaders and all of those things so that you set yourself up as well as possible. So I want to know what keeps you motivated. <laughs> um. Well, I, now that I now that it's now that I'm a published author, the biggest thing that keeps me motivated is um, is seeing you know seeing the good reviews come in, and um, that just means the world. I mean, we I know you're as you said you're focusing this season on on reviews, and um, they're important for selling, and and they're important for spreading the word, but they meet sure mean a lot personally to to the author. And, um, there's been so many times I've been down and just almost re not ready to quit. Cause I would never quit writing. I don't think any writer would, but just, you know, almost given up on, on this book or, or, and, and then a good review comes in that says, uh, you know, this was so good. I read it twice. And it's like, man, you just, you're ready to go again. And that keeps me motivated. Um, before I was published and I didn't have wasn't able to see that. Um, one thing I did when I was, if I was setting aggressive writing goals or, it, you know, if I wanted to have a first draft done by a certain date, um, I would write that, I would write that date on a sticky note and put it on my monitor. So I see it a hundred times a day. And um, it just, I, to me, that really helps because you got to see, you got to write it down and you got to see it, got to see it a lot. And mm -hmm. so that would be a, that kept me that keeps me motivated when I'm um, when I'm in a in my writing mode. <laughs> right. Well, and, that, and that's great. And, and I agree with you. I do that with myself. It's like, you know, I may not be a deadline or something, but it's like I want to reach this goal by that date and having it right in front of me, either on my calendar, on a sticky note that helps. But I wanted to go back to something else you mentioned about these reviews. And that's great once you're a published author, but sometimes it's difficult to get the reviews. You know, people are not fond of writing reviews, but so what I tell people is if you're still a writer, if you're still unpublished, and even if you are newly published, write yourself a letter from your future reviewer or a future reader. And because I, I tell people to do this when they're writing and they're struggling and they're trying to figure out who their audience is because it does a lot of things. It's very encouraging. And then I tell them just like frame it, 
put it up where somewhere where you can see it every single day. And it's very motivating, even though it's your words back to you, it's something that you're looking forward to hearing. And now you may not hear those exact words, but it, it is very motivating. And I'm glad you brought that up because we do work in a very lonely, isolating business. And it doesn't have a lot of, you know, brownie points being passed out. So yeah, yeah. The, the the reviews are kind of like our report card for how well we did as an author and a writer. So I want to know, <clears throat> This book, it's your second book, The Hills Be Shaken. So we're focusing on reviews here for the second season. So I want to know what you would write as a review for your own book. Um, yeah, I'd I'd say this uh, this is a great thriller with intriguing mystery. Uh, I, I was I was up late turning pages wondering. Uh, wondering how it was going to end, um, but what sets this uh, story apart is the interesting er engineering aspects. I learned a lot and uh, can't wait for the next book in the series. Well, I agree, and he just proved her point of put him on the spot, made him write a review about his own book, and so that's kind of why we're doing it this season not only to promote reviews, but to show you how easy it is when I put these authors on the spot about writing their own reviews about their own book. It's a little difficult because we're coming from a different perspective, but it's also showing our audience how easy it is to just write a quick review. It's just your opinion and we value those opinions. So what's next for Michael? Uh, well, I, hint I hinted at it a little just a second ago. I, um, I wasn't necessarily going to, I, I have always had a dream that the Mose Haley, the character would be a, a, a series. Um, and, and, uh, much like, um, the Jack Reacher series, for example, where the, they're sort of standalone and closed. Mm -hmm. Each story is, you know, you don't have to read them in order. You don't have to, there's nothing serial about them, but, um, that's, that was kind of, that's my, uh, vision for the, for the character and mm -hmm. so but I wasn't necessarily going to write the next book next mm -hmm. um I had started some I had uh started a different book but uh I really want to there's a lot of momentum with this book and and the reviews are are uh coming in so so good I want to keep I want to keep going I want to keep the story going so I'm working on book number two and um and it'll be coming soon <laughs> okay so we don't have a an estimated uh, release date or anything for that yet? Not yet. I want to make sure I take my own advice and, and so, uh, okay. take my time. <laughs> right. So it's not something we would expect in 2023. Is it possible for 2024 or are we looking further out? Tw yeah, 2024, I'd say. Okay. okay. Well, you know, when you have that book ready to go out, of course, we would love for you to come back on the Writer's Parachute and talk about the... Uh, the next Mose Haley book, and they call those character series. So uh, yes. it's, it's a little bit different than a serial series, but um, yeah, so look forward to those. And those are always fun. Uh, I, I'm a series gal. I like writing, reading series, uh, even if they're just character series. They're so much fun because you kind of know those people and you want to see what happens next. So that's mm -hmm. exciting. So we want to know where listeners can find you or find your books. I'm sorry. Yeah, probably the easiest uh, is on Amazon. Just uh, search for it there. Um, it's it's the audio book is available. Uh, it's read. It was uh, read by uh, Eric Baker, and he did an awesome job. Um, so if if you want to hear a really high quality audible audio audio book, it's on Audible, iTunes. But again, you can get there through Amazon also. So Amazon's the easiest way. Um, you. Can, can also go to my website michaelstewart.fun and get there that way too okay great and just for our listening audience you don't need to go run and grab a pen and paper because we're going to put all these links in the show notes for you we'll have a link to his book and his audio book on amazon and a link to his website so um 
is it available at any other stores in case we've got listeners who would like to shop other than Amazon? Um, if the paperback's available uh, on different online, it's mm -hmm. on Barnes and Noble, uh, Target, it's at different places. Okay. Um, the the ebook is is uh, Kindle. It's available uh, on Kindle, Kindle Unlimited, Unlimited, so it's exclusive to Kindle to, to okay. Amazon. Okay, great. Well, we'll go ahead and add some links for that. Um, so I know you're up on social media. So you, can you let our listeners know where they can follow you there? Yeah, uh, I'm on Twitter. The handles at Hump Day Hoop or at Hump Day Hoopla. So I used to do a Wednesday newsletter. Um, and so that's that's where the it was called hump day hoopla so that's where that came from um but uh yeah that's where that's kind of my main social media so only on twitter you're not on facebook instagram or, or tiktok no okay all right again we will uh put the links to that for you in the show notes and you did say you had a website michaelstewart.fun so uh, we want to know if you have any upcoming events or information that you would like to share with the audience before we go over to our tip of the week. Yeah, I, I always like uh, getting books out there, getting my story out there. So if any listeners, if I'd be happy to send them an autographed uh, copy of the book for free, if they just purchase it in any other form, uh, if they buy the, uh, if they buy the ebook or the the audiobook, uh, and just you can message me on the website, and I'll be happy to send you an autographed paper uh, paperback. First, first ten. I can't do it unlimited though. So, but all right, yeah, be happy to do it. All right. Well, you guys heard it here. So the first ten that contact Michael at his website with a receipt of the purchase of his book in any form, he will send you an autographed copy. So that's exciting. I'll have to make sure I go be one of those first ten. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So is there anything else that you wanted to share with us before we go talk about the tip of the week? Uh, just um. I wanted to point out that uh, Amazon's Whisper Sync is really cool. I don't know if uh, you've, I can't remember if you've mentioned it on the, on the show in the past. Um, but if you, if, if, uh, if a book is on uh, Kindle and uh, Audible, uh, then Amazon has a Whisper Sync feature where if you, uh, if you, uh, you can read it and then listen to the audio later and it'll pick up where you left off on either one. And what, what really makes it cool is that um, you can buy, a lot of times the you can buy the the Kindle book. Mine is only, uh, mine's on sale right now for a limited time for only $1.49, um, if you buy the Kindle book, um, you get a greatly discounted off the audio book. So you can actually buy the both copies for less than it would be just to buy the audio book on Audible. Usually they're like, 1995 or something like that and get it way less if you've already owned the, the ebook so just a tip right and i i do love that tip because i use it myself and, and he is right you can usually buy the the ebook uh if it's available on audible it'll ask you at a hugely discounted price it's usually about 50 to 60 percent off if you want to buy the whisper sync and they both work on your kindle app so you can switch right. back and forth between the audio playing or you actually reading and it does keep track so that they're all synced together. That's that's an amazing tip. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and jump over to our tip of the week. And this week we're going to be talking about some of the things that um, we, I think we skipped the question. I don't know how we did that. <laughs> We we skipped the question, but I was talking to Michael in the um, green room and he was talking about the, the struggles and challenges that he had in writing and publishing his book. And he said part of it was the loneliness of, you know, very closed isolation around being an author and writing a book. So we wanted to talk about that a little bit. And I'm going to let Michael jump in and tell you what he experienced. And then I'm going to give you the tip to deal with that. Yeah, uh, when I yeah when I discovered kind of the writing community on Twitter and was able to uh, realize that all these other people on there have are going through very similar experiences and their loneliness, as you said, you know, usually there's not anyone in your regular life that <clears throat> that 
is understands what it's like, what you're going through and, and, and how, how uh, mentally difficult it is or uh, emotionally difficult, I should say, just, they don't know how you feel, but the, that writing community on Twitter, uh, it's, it's like, uh, they all get you and they're, you're all part of, uh, it's, it's a nice family. Yes, it is. And, you know, and there are, uh, writing groups pretty much on all social media. I myself host a couple of writing groups a week through Shut Up and Write, which is pretty much international. You can do online courses. They also are online meetings. They also have, uh, in-person meetings. If you go to the meetup app or shutupright.com, uh, you can see what the listing for those meetings are. And it's really good. You're not really working or collaborating on a book. You're just in the same space with writers and talk about the issues with writing and, you know, with the loneliness, but, you know, you brought up an interesting point. It's the, it's the understanding of the mental and emotional uh, draining that we have when we're creating because we are creating out of our mind out of our imagination even if you're writing a self-help book or a nonfiction book you're still mm -hmm. creating the text out of your own mind you're pulling the pack facts and figures into a cohesive story or book that still requires a lot of deep thought and deep emotions and this is one of the things that you know I, I laugh about this I'm talking to my husband all the time and he'll come in and I'm laying down and he's like what are you doing and I'm like I'm plotting <laughs> because <laughs> it does take you know a lot of thing you know where I'm deep in my head trying to figure out what should I do next or how should I approach this scene or what does that character struggle with or you know all of these things which is kind of outside of the understanding of most people who do not attempt to to write uh so that was a great thing and that is very good you always want to have these writing groups or these uh you know the ability to have accountability partners and people to talk to about what you're dealing with because trust me that's part of the reason we do the writer's parachute is to talk about the things that nobody wants to talk about in writing books in publishing books and struggling you are not the only person out there that struggles with this we all do to some extent you may struggle with something different than I do but that doesn't mean my struggle or your struggle is any less and it always helps to talk to somebody who seriously understands not to mention it's uplifting to have that community so that if you are struggling with something particular you can reach out and ask for for help or for somebody to listen to you talk about a scene that you're struggling with and they may have a great point of view so these writing groups are critical so i would say that that's that's important if you do feel like you're isolated and you do feel like you're lonely of course there may be other mental health issues. And if that is true, we, we of course encourage you to seek help for that. We're not uh, professionals in any way, but if it is writing related, we want you to try and reach out to other authors and writers, either through social media or through one of these writing groups and, you know, get some interaction with other authors. It'll make you a better writer. And it'll also make you feel like you're part of the community. I think this, uh, this is part of the thing that we see is, is I, as you know, Authors feel like they're in competition with each other, and that's not really true. We're in competition with the books on the shelf, not with each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I just have one more question before we're going to go off for the day and um, on to our next episode. So I want to know, what do you think readers are going to think of your book, The Hills Be Shaking, in 10 to 20 years from now? Do you think it's going to be prophetic? Or do you think it's going to be something that they're going to go, oh, well, that's not going to happen? Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I think a lot of the things that uh, that a lot of the scary things that come up in the book could happen uh, by then. Um, and I also hope uh, people are talking about it and saying, oh, I really want to get started on this series. Which one should I read first? Um read the hills be shaken first and then go from there so 
Well, I, I love it. And as I said, I'm going to go in and finish this book because I could barely put it down in time to come and talk to you. So. <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate you being here on the Writer's Parachute. And always, I am so thankful and grateful to be the host here for the Writer's Parachute. We're guiding author and writer dreams to a perfect landing. And we hope that you find this space a creative space for your creative work and that it lands your dreams as well. Until next time. Bye.